Listening instructions. The listening test is about 30 minutes long and audio will be played once. There are four parts to the listening test. You will be given 10 minutes after the completion of the test to transfer answers to an answer sheet. Each part contains 10 questions with a total of 40 questions. Test 3. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a language student and an advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents, vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. The documents are essential, so A has been written in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents, vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room, the personal effects in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. Oh, thanks for the warning. Now, something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had her smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage? Usually, yes. But because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again, you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. 
Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. Hmm. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address. Just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark. Lewis and Amy Wark. So that's W-A-L-K? It's actually W-A-R-K, but we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage, enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <sighs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. Okay. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. Test 3. Section 2. You will hear an extract from a talk about facilities for students with disabilities. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to Student Times, the programme with all the latest on what's happening at universities around the country. Today we'll be discussing disabled applicants and the kind of support they can expect to find, or not find, at the university of their choice. With me to tell us more is Student Disability Advisor Sally Taylor. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, Hugh. I'd like to start by pointing out that although one in four people has some kind of disability, the proportion among students is much lower. This is partly because most students are under 25 and many people only develop their disabilities as they get older, but it's also because some universities don't do much to encourage access. Mm. It is true, though, that some have quite sticky problems when it comes to, um, for instance, wheelchair access, um, ancient buildings, cobbled streets built centuries ago, and so on. 
When faced with such a situation, some universities make an extra special effort to provide for students with particular disabilities, while others have specialist accommodation. In fact, all universities should have a written policy statement on students with disabilities, setting out what facilities they have, what their attitude is, and what they're prepared to do. But having said that, only you can properly understand the challenges of any disability you have. And so, before accepting a place at a university, or even while you're considering applying, if only to raise the university's awareness, it's good to talk to them and find out how much they can and will do for you. The problem is who to talk to. Most universities and some students' unions have a disability advisor who is supposed to know what facilities they already have and will help with further arrangements if necessary or possible. However, all too often this person is a token. Sometimes it's just an extra responsibility given to a secretary. They don't know what the situation is in practice and they don't have any real authority to change anything. So, given that for any prospective student it's best to visit a university before applying, it's an especially good idea for students with disabilities or special needs to check whether the place really does come up to scratch. Uh -huh. In general, the university should provide personal care and assistance, and there are certain key features to look out for if you have a particular disability, including the following. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Firstly, if your mobility is impaired, check there are ramps and easy access to all buildings, not just accommodation or teaching rooms. Then, when you're inside, look for clear instructions on fire and emergency procedures for the disabled. Also, make sure there are lifts that work, not the usual ones that seem to be out of order half the time and check for suitable lavatory facilities. There is a different set of things to look for if you suffer from any kind of hearing impairment. There should be induction loops in lecture theatres, flashing sirens in all rooms and in accommodation, visual doorbells that light up when somebody calls round to see you. If it is your sight that is impaired, there obviously need to be braille translators of books and documents. In all buildings, the stairs, floors, doorways and windows must have clear markings and there also have to be special fire and emergency procedures for you. If you suffer from dyslexia, you will need a computer for general use and in exams. And as exams may take you longer to complete, you should be allowed extra time in which to do so. This applies to work in general too. There are, of course, many other possible health difficulties that you may suffer from, such as diabetes, epilepsy or heart conditions. If this is the case, check the availability of access to appropriate treatment, including medication and or therapy. Finally, make sure that in the event of an emergency, it is clear what you and other people who may be involved have to do. That is the end of section two. Test three, section three. You will hear three students discussing a programme of activities for new students at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. So you were both on last year's orientation course, then. How did it go? I loved it. The activities were well organised, and I met people from all over the world. Yes, it was useful. And you think I should sign up for this year's course? Yes, definitely. Apart from being fun, it really does prepare you for all the things you have to do in your first couple of weeks. In fact, one of the most useful things was chatting to people who'd already been there for a year, so-called senior students. They'd been on the orientation course the year before last and recommended it to us. Oh, and there was a great atmosphere at the formal dinner too. It was so colourful with people in their traditional dress from Asia, Africa, South America. It was one of the high points of the whole week. That was right at the end, of course. The first thing they did on the Monday was to take us on a guided tour of the students' union. And after that, they took us round the city centre, showing us things like the bus station, the main shop, and the best pubs. Right. <laughs> so it was very worthwhile. Yes, though maybe they could have taken us to a better nightclub. The music at the place we went to was lousy. <laughs> That's a matter of taste, surely. Well, anyway, the next day they showed us round everything on the campus. And believe me, it was everything. We must have walked miles. I could have done with less information on every building in sight, given that I'll probably never need to go into half of them, and a bit more on places everyone's likely to use at some time or other, like the sports block, the health centre, the bicycle and car park. Which reminds me, there was an afternoon session on how to drive in this country, which seemed to me a bit weird, you know, for a university course. I suppose it's because there have been accidents involving students who aren't used to people driving on the left. I was there actually. How was it? Well, I must say I was a bit disappointed. There were some useful driving tips, but it might have been more helpful if it had included stuff for pedestrians, how to avoid getting run over, for example. You didn't go to the session on safety then? No. Well, apparently that dealt with road safety for pedestrians, along with lots of other aspects. Of course, I wasn't there myself, but that might be something worth going to, Julia. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. I like the sound of the whole thing. Tell me, what's the accommodation like? Do you have a room to yourself, or do you have to share? What do you have to take with you? For the orientation course, you'll have an individual room in one of the halls of residence. That'll be a different hall from the one you're booked into for the year, but they're both on the campus, so you won't have far to go. And you won't have to take much with you. The room will have chairs, table, wardrobe, bed, mattress, blankets, sheets, and so on. Take a warm coat or jacket, though. It may well rain, and it's unlikely to reach even twenty degrees in late September. But it shouldn't drop below about ten, at least during the day, which is something, I suppose. <laughs> right. Now I know they can't do much about the weather, but did you have the feeling that they were looking after you on the course? Yes, we did. There were some little touches that showed they thought about what it was like to be starting a course of study abroad, such as. Well, it's just a small example, but they gave us free email access to contact people at home. Thirty minutes, if I remember correctly. Actually, I think it was twenty.、Mm, yes, you're right. I was on for over half an hour and paid for an extra ten or fifteen minutes. Not that it was much. <laughs> Emails don't take long to write, anyway. No, they don't. So, just one more thing: the timetable. When does the course actually start and finish? Well, a lot of people get there on the Sunday, though you'd have to find a room for an extra night, as the course accommodation is only booked from the Monday when things get going.、Mm -hmm. Then they'll keep you busy all week until the dinner on the Friday. 
And that's it, is it? Yes. There's nothing after that. Though most people stay over till Saturday, partly to recover from the party, <laughs> but also because they can then move straight into their permanent rooms. <laughs> I think I'll do that. Well, thanks a lot for all your advice. I'm sure I'll enjoy the course. I wish I could go on this year's too. <laughs> That is the end of section three. Test 3. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about fireworks. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this short talk on the subject of fireworks. Now, fireworks, as I'm sure many of you know, were invented in China, though there has long been disagreement as to exactly when, or even in which century. The consensus nowadays, though, is that it was in the 6th, as there is considerable evidence of war rockets being made then. We also know that fireworks were in use by the 7th century in Arabia, where they were called Chinese arrows, reflecting their military potential. It then took a long time for them to spread to Europe. In fact, it wasn't until the 1200s that fireworks made their appearance there. The basic ingredients of fireworks have changed little to this day. Their explosive capacity comes mainly from black powder, also known as gunpowder, which is produced from a mixture of charcoal, sulfur, and potassium nitrate. A modern aerial firework, the kind used nowadays in big public displays, not the small rocket type that you might remember from your childhood, is normally made in the form of a shell often a sphere about the size of a peach. Inside the shell are a number of stars, surrounded by black powder, and running through the centre of the round shell is a charge that makes the firework explode when it reaches the desired altitude. This is known as the bursting charge. When this explodes, it ignites the outside of the stars, which begin to burn with bright showers of sparks. Since the explosion throws the stars in all directions, you get the huge sphere of sparkling light that is so familiar at firework displays. A shell of this kind is launched from a 75mm diameter mortar, which in some ways resembles the type used by the military. The mortar is a steel, or increasingly for safety reasons, shatterproof plastic pipe. This is likely to be 500 millimetres long and sealed at one end. The other end is aimed at the sky, and at the bottom of the pipe, below the shell, is placed a cylinder containing black powder. This has a long fuse, which projects out of the tube. When this is lit, it quickly burns down to the lifting charge, which explodes to launch the shell. In so doing, it also lights the shell's fuse. The shell's fuse burns while the shell rises to its correct altitude and then ignites the bursting charge so it explodes. More complicated shells are divided into sections, 
and burst in two or three phases. Shells like this are called multi-break shells. They may contain stars of different colours and compositions to create softer or brighter light, more or less sparks, etc. Some shells contain explosives designed to crackle in the sky, or whistles that explode outward with the stars. The sections of a multi-break shell are ignited by different fuses, and the bursting of one section ignites the next. The shells must be assembled in such a way that each section explodes in sequence to produce a distinct, separate effect. The pattern that an aerial shell paints in the sky depends on the arrangement of stars inside the shell. For example, if the stars are equally spaced in a circle, with black powder inside the circle, you will see an aerial display of smaller star explosions equally spaced in a circle. To create a specific figure in the sky, for instance a heart shape, you create an outline of the figure in stars inside the shell. Then you place explosive charges inside those stars to blow them outward into the shape of a large heart. Each charge has to be ignited at exactly the right time, or the whole thing is spoiled. Many other shapes have particular names, like the willow. This is formed by stars that fall in the shape of willow tree branches, spreading a little to the side and then downwards. The high charcoal composition of the stars makes them long-burning, so they may even stay visible until they hit the ground. The ring shell is fairly basic. It is produced by stars exploding outwards to produce a symmetrical ring of coloured lights. More complex is the pattern created by the palm, which contains large comets, or charges, in the shape of a solid cylinder. These travel outwards, explode, and then curve downwards, like the limbs of a palm tree. The serpentine, the last one for now, is different again. When this one bursts, it sends small tubes of incendiaries scattering outwards in random paths, which may culminate in exploding stars. It can be quite spectacular. That is the end of Test 3.